Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for coming uh, in the lunch hour. Um, my name is Steve Saxby, and I guess some of you have seen the invite, all of you, I guess, and will know the reason why we're all here to talk today about the book. But before I started talking, or we'll start to talk about things um, within the book and how it came to be and such, and um, I thought it might be worth just having words from somebody who's a good deal more known in the Port of Burton than I am, who also left 30 years ago. Uh, Rob Mansfield, uh, the manager of Special Vehicle Engineering. Rob, just give me a speech. Well, you've almost given my speech for me. <laughs> uh, uh, I was minded of a, a funeral I went to recently, and unfortunately, more and more of my life is taken up with this. And uh, somebody was looking at me, Bill Mead, I don't know if you know Bill Mead, uh, the wonderful rally guy, it was his funeral, unfortunately. And uh, somebody came up to me and was looking. I don't know who it is, but, um, and he came up to me afterwards and said, uh, you used to be Rob Mansfield. <laughs> I said, well, hang on a minute, I not only used to be, but I still am. <laughs> and what's more, that was uh, a few years ago now, so I still am. And um, Steve's book has been uh, getting me involved a little bit, and I've realized that uh, writing a book like this, this tone, which I actually weighed this morning on the kitchen scales, and is, what did I say, three, three kilograms and yeah. three kilograms sixty. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of book for your money anyway. Um, and uh, I realized what a task it is to put a book together like that. And my first comment to Steve, who lives in New York most of the time, I faxed him and said, um, uh, I don't, I don't understand this. It's obviously far more complex and difficult and, and um, time consuming to write a book about something than to do the original engineering. So yes, I did have a, 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 a marvelous job in this building here and uh, it finished uh, 29 years ago. Yes, And I've, I've only actually been back here once or twice, I think it is, which is my fault. Um, but it was a, a wonderful job. All those exciting cars there you saw, we were uh, down to engineer them. And I've learned quite a lot from the book, uh, especially how much uh, Bob Lutz had in involvement in, in setting up my department. But anyway, I've taken on a completely new respect for authors in general, and Steve in particular, I must say. So, uh, Steve, I, I know you've only got 50 odd minutes or something, yeah. I'd better hand over to you right now. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, Rod. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, as Rod said, I, I did actually check. It is 30 years this year since I was last in this building. and. I have to tell you, I'm really excited to be back. It's quite strange, actually, and I'll talk a little bit, only a little bit, about me and, and the things I've done. And it's been so long since I was here, so long since I was even in, in Essex. And um, so it is quite exciting to talk to everybody here, and it's, it's dialed in as well. So, um, and time is over with these uh, things short, so let's, uh, let's get started here now. And, uh, and as ever, the mouse goes to sleep on these things. Um, of course it does. It's probably the book. Um, so, uh, how many of you have got a copy? Just out of interest here. Probably, yeah. Not yet. Um, how many of you reached the end in that case, then? Oh. Two. That's more than most I would expect. I have to tell you, the, the biggest problem is it took me two months to read my own book, um, and I know the ending, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's a much bigger book to read than I realised that learned to write, it's true. Um, so I, I, I sort of got this vision for what this book could be, and it's probably summed up best by uh, Mel Nichols, my editor. Um, for those of you of a certain age, uh, like myself, and now in my 50s, we grew up reading Car Magazine and Mel Nichols. Uh, Steve Cropley, some of the most famous editors of Car Magazine, and Mel, uh, I was delighted to have as the editor of, of, of my book, which I think is quite an honour. And, and 
because he's a much better writer than I am, frankly, uh, Mel said, it's an important book about an important company, it's important people, and the important cards they made. And I think, in some ways, this is almost, not really a tribute to Ford, but it's also something that's very motivational. You can come through this story, you see some of the excitement that existed in this place, in Rod's team, in Merkinick, um, along the way as, company, as, as, as the company grew. Uh, um, so, so that's a, that's a summary, if you like, that's, that, that's in one sentence of what this, this book represents. Um, and what I thought I'd quickly do is talk through um, a little bit about the inspiration for, for the book, and, and then show you some of it, and show you some of the backstory behind it as well. Um, so, um, and I can see Duncan still has the latest equipment here in IT. Here, so, <laughs> um, so um, a little bit about me. So, for motor company, there I was. That's where I began. Uh, I grew up in Reading. Um, I have acquired a much more pretentious accent over the years, so um, people have no idea where I come from these days. Uh, I spent most of my recent years in New York, uh, so I'm over here to see my mum, actually, is why I'm here, and to see New York. From Ford, I moved to Master. Uh, very exciting period at Master, actually, in truth, after what were some very exciting years in the late 80s, and perhaps less exciting times at C14, when I left um, in 1990. Uh, from there, in my ever Ever, never any really request to get uh, a fancier company car. I moved to Porsche, um, so uh, <laughs> uh, trying my best to get the uh, the, the, the best uh, roadster I could as a company car, and then I maybe went down the step to to catering cars. Um, so at that point, I think I'd probably done enough of the car manufacturers, and I moved over for those of uh, those of us that uh, can't do it. It's better to be a consultant. So I spent uh, 10, 15 years in management consulting. Um, at Future Brand, where I ran the global automotive practice. And that was very much in the halcyon days of brand strategy, and those of you that can remember the NASA days of branding and all of that stuff, when the trust mark came, came from Bond Ford Motor Company. Um, I, I worked in that field for many, many years, and it was actually a very exciting time. Uh, I moved from, from design to engineering into marketing. That's really the three pillars of this book, is design, engineering, and marketing. And as Rod kindly said, I don't think it's necessarily easy to engineer a car, particularly today, but what I tried to do in this book is to imagine this is almost a masterclass for a reader, whether you're an engineer or a designer or a marketer. But for anybody that's inside the business or somebody who's outside of Ford or a Dean, any car company, is to understand the bigger scope of design, engineering, and marketing. Because I know when I worked here at Dunton, I go, ah, marketing, it's just a few ads sort of thing. And, and Adam here from our ad agency will tell you it's quite a lot of work to produce the marketing. And I was really lucky to get the involvement of some of the, uh, the two guys, the two guys that did Ford's advertising for 22 years, and they're actually in the book, and I'm having lunch with them tomorrow, and these are wonderful old guys, and um, they, they ran Ferraris as their company cars, which was, uh, they did far better than I did, clearly, in their career. Um, and, and, and the story of marketing, I think, is intrinsic to Ford, as it is to some other car companies, and so that's woven into the stories, these, uh, these magical stories of design, engineering, and marketing. Back to a little bit about me before we move on. I work for J.D. Power, a research company in their consulting group, and y &R, which is one of the big advertising agencies that did some work before. Though I, funnily enough, have never actually ever worked in the Ford business. I, I've done very little work with Ford in my entire career. For reasons I've never quite understood the truth. Um, but then um, I, I sort of got a little bit hooked on uh, getting an ever fancier company car, and I went back to one of the car manufacturers after a 12 year uh, layoff. And I went to Jaguar, um, and I moved back from America to, to live in the UK, in delightful Livington Spa. Um, and I worked for Jaguar, uh, which is a small company that Ford used to own. And um, I ran uh, global advertising for Jaguar for a while. Um, we had the uh, lowest level of sales, I think I'm record that here. Um, uh, but I think they're the most frequent level of sales on Porsche as well, so um, just a little note for anybody that wants to get me involved. Um, <laughs> from there, um, I, I moved to uh, Nissan um, uh, for, for their advertising agency group, uh, Omnicom, running their global brand strategy. So I didn't get such a nice company car, but I did get to travel around the world for an eternity, actually, which is quite tiring, but sounds very glamorous. Um, from there, I decided perhaps it would be a little, little less frenetic and I might see my wife occasionally. So uh, I went to, uh, back to WPP Group, which is uh, a long-standing advertising agency of Ford, but actually also 
uh, had, had the VW business and I ran the Volkswagen media business. And then as the true calamity came, I had to manage the company through Dieselgate. So that was, uh, that was a spectacular amount of fun, I have to tell you. Um, so it was at that point I thought, you know what, I think it's time to take a year out to write the book. I just <laughs> had enough of, of calamity and stuff, so I decided to write this book. And people ask me, where does this book come from? And I have to tell you, it is quite a lot of work to write a book. And I'm not really a journalist. I'm not an author. I grew up around here. I trained as a body employee. And I just wandered around learning how to write. And I have to tell you, it is quite a lot of work. And I thought before we go into the detail, I'd give you a little bit about the inspiration for me. And it truly is our favorite Irish pub singer, uh, Bono. And I, I was at a concert um, one night, and Bono, he actually stole the words from me, it's an American author, uh, write the book you always wanted to read. And somewhere along the way, I was reading a book, I think it was a book randomly on trial, I don't know why. And I was reading this book, and I got nothing from it. And I realized that most of the car books I've read, and you may be the same, they're very much about the engineering nuts and bolts, which is fine perhaps from an engineering context, but there's only, only so many lists of gear ratios you can read, only so many stories of the suspension setting was changed. Well, uh, the, the, there is a bigger story. There's a story of the people, there's a story of the conception of a car, all the stuff that's going across the road in design and product planning. That story never gets told because journalists don't understand that well. And they also don't understand advertising, so they'll say, here's an ad. They don't paint the story of how the car was positioned relative to its concept. And that was a story I really wanted to tell. And I always felt Ford of Europe has got so much drama about it. It's been so successful. It's had highs and lows, as we all know. And it's clearly in a, in a transitory point now. But that was the book I wanted to write. I wanted to tell the story of Ford of Europe. So that's great having a vision. Um, the problem then is executing it. So, I didn't want to do gear ratios, I didn't want to do endless pictures of press pictures, and those of you who have got the book, I hope you'd agree, the book is full of unusual stuff. I mean, it's full of images, and I'll share those later, that you just don't see, even if you work with them. <coughs> First hand interviews. We live in a world of connectivity like never before. I involve the internet, social media. I've probably had hundreds of people help me work on this book. The way of writing a book is transformed. Now, I must confess, I didn't realize how it transformed. But it was really fascinating to me to reach out to retirees. I was getting design sketches from a retired Ford designer in Czechoslovakia, stuff you couldn't do. You couldn't connect with these people. It's amazing how this changed. More fundamentally, I wanted to have a story thread. I wanted this to be a book that people would enjoy. I didn't want to have to read another book on gear ratio. So what I realized was the story was going to be really important. So the problem is, is to quote the, um, the, the, the phrase that I used of Mel's back there, this is such a big company, it has such a big story, and it's also interwoven with Dearborn, and whether for good or for bad, it's a global story as well. And so I realized that this was almost, if this wasn't going to end up as a trilogy, I needed a lens through to tell the story, because otherwise nobody would ever finish it. I mean, it's difficult enough to get through this. It took me two months to read my own book, for God's sake, and, and I know the ending. So um, it, 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 it is a big book, but I wanted it to not be anything other than good read, fun to read, and not be too big. So because I wanted to include the stories of how cars came to be and understand the prototypes, that everybody loves the prototypes. I mean, you guys see them here at Dunton every day, but going back through history, all the abandoned cars and the days of the mules and all of those things that because of the world we live in simultaneous engineering today, they're kind of not quite there, but I wanted to tell those stories of days gone past because I just think they're fascinating. So I needed a lens, and this is the lens I decided to tell the story. So it's through the lens of Ford's coupes. Now, these are, in many respects, the cars I've always promised myself. I had a few of them myself in the young year. Um, and it is the coupe I find the most interesting because the coupe is always the maverick in Ford's or any other manufacturer's range. It's the non-conformist non -conformist sedan or truck or SUV. So from that perspective, the, the, the lens of the coupe was always going to allow me to tell the most interesting story. The other thing it's fair to say is Capri was kind of my specialist subject. For those of you that were here 30 years ago, you may remember being perfect around the particular Capri days gone by. Um, and 
So I, I had a little bit of a leaning, I, I won't lie on the Capri side, but I think it's also a very romantic car for Ford Motor Company as the cars once came. So what we see, it's like Doctor Who, you see these images change over time as the lens, the story of the, the Ford Coupe allows the book to tell the story of the cars around it. So the secondary characters of the Escort, Pietro, Granada, whatever, Mondeo, they're around it as secondary characters, but the core character is this evolution of this, this central piece of casting called the Coupe. So that was the lens to tell the story. Um, the other reason is, is I didn't want to do another RS book. If I did another RS book, um, it's going to be just another book about gear ratios and, 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 and Rod Smiley, because Rod's had enough books written around the SPE cars, and one day we'll do another, I'm sure, is um, I, I needed to tell this bigger story. So that lens, that thread allowed me to do it. So having come up with an idea, that sounds great. So the problem then is getting started, to be perfectly <laughs> honest with you. Um, I, the last book I wrote was a really modest book about 22 years ago. So I'm a, I'm a slow writer. Um, I don't do them very often, so I will see you all in 22 years' time. But um, it takes an awful lot of effort. It needs an idea. That's great. I had the idea. Now it needs to be executed. It needs patience. Um, you can't rush these things. I had planned originally to do this in four months. Um, it took me a year to actually do the writing and probably two years from when it first came into my mind. And you can actually hold this item here. Um, it's not a small exercise to undertake. Particularly when you're not a known journalist, you don't really know the ins and outs of three-line edits and all these things I had to learn. <coughs> you need a publisher. Now, I was very lucky. Every publisher I spoke to wanted my book. That gave me an indication that every motoring publisher wanted my book. This is a story that could be told. That was great. The only problem is, is um, most publishers will pay you a royalty of about 5%, um, which means I get two weeks' money for a year's work. That's not really going to work for me having my mortgage, unfortunately. So I had to really do some quite clever negotiation with the publisher as a partnership. They needed a designer, an illustrator. Um, and it's almost the difference between, uh, uh, for those of you who work in design, between the modelers and, 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 and the designers is I need the illustrator. The, these beautiful illustrations you see, by the way, none of those are Photoshop. That's drawn by uh, a man in Paris um, on coral draw. They're, they're actually hand-drawn, every one of those illustrations. So I need an illustrator for the cover, but I also needed a designer for the book. And I lucked out. The designer for my book is a car enthusiast like you wouldn't believe. And he took this on as a <coughs> project. And I have to say, and I'll be sharing some of the images, the design of this book is beautiful. I can't take the credit for that. I have to give the credit, and I will always to the design. But it is a beautiful book. I also needed the marketing. My specialist field, I can do the marketing stuff. That's great, and, 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 and it's exciting to market a book and actually do the proper marketing. I've always marketed cars. It's fun to market a book. It's great. Um, also, one of the most key people is an editor. Um, that man you see at the bottom there, Mel Nichols. I mentioned him earlier. Mel Nichols, the former editor of Car Magazine. Um, for years, he was the editorial board director of Haymarket, so he was the boss of the editors of What Car and Auto Car, all of those magazines. So Mel is in the trade, he's a real big name. I reached out to Mel because we used to work together when I was at Jaguar with Haymarket, um, who he was the boss of. And I said, Mel, can you recommend me an editor? And I was frankly bewildered, embarrassed, amazed, and humbled. Mel offered to be my editor, and I can't believe that Mel Nichols is the editor of my book. But and, and he's been absolutely great. And so, for those of you that have got the book, you might feel there's a bit of the old car magazine from the 70s and 80s there. That's not by accident, to be perfectly honest with you. That's a deliberate intent to make it feel um, a slightly more creative, a slightly in-depth, a slightly more cerebral, and not just a generic car book. And that you have to thank for not just my vision of the book, but also uh, the editor Mel and, and, and the designer. That's all very well, that's all the stuff you need to get a book done. But then you also need the help. You need the help from Ford. Um, now I have to tell you, I was incredibly nervous about engaging Ford on this. Uh, we all know Henry Ford's history is bunk. Um, and Ford people were sending me stuff. As soon as I started reaching out, somebody gave me some photos of, well, your team actually, Rod, uh, the Sierra Targa. Um, uh, Whoever knew there was a Sierra Targa, uh, 
I'm thinking, I'm starting to get this confidential stuff from 30 years, 20 years, 10 years ago. I need to reach out to Ford. So I reached out to Ford of Britain PR, and, and I got these various emails. And, and it was quite funny, because I could tell by the tone of these emails that people were not replying instantly, and it was going up a level, up a level, up a level. And, and in the end, I got this official email. We have, we have considered your request, Steve, for the, uh, using uh, documentation from the past. And we have decided anything you are given by a third party is entirely yours to use, and we therefore should not comment. Good luck with the book. <laughs> and it was the classic, I say, British turning a blind eye, Nelson thing, where uh, I realized at this point, Ford of Britain, and actually as it transpires, Ford of Europe, were very much behind the book. And I was then granted access to Ford's archives in Cologne. I don't know if for those of you in the room with me here have done it. Ford of Britain doesn't have any archives anymore. They're all shipped to Dearborn. Um, if you want to use uh, an image from Ford in Dearborn, it's $375, um, which would just give it an additional $50,000 worth of cost of this book. Um, the Germans, on the other hand, uh, decided they just wouldn't say no, and they locked it all the way. And uh, so the, 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 there is an archive kept in Germany. That's the archive I used a lot for this book. Ford Enthusiasts. Um, the help of Ford Enthusiasts has been really important, not just because they're a large part of the customer base for the book, but also it's good to work with them to understand what interests the Ford Enthusiasts, to use Facebook, to ask the odd question. Um, I remember one day, I, I, I think it's a lovely story, there's a car in here called the uh, Barquetta. Any of you remember the Barquetta? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Okay, so the Barquetta will come to you. So it's a wonderful car. It's a Porsche Boxster designed by Ford back in 1982 in miniature form uh, by, uh, by uh, Filippo Supino from here. And I wanted to find out what happened to this car. So I asked <coughs> Facebook, uh, does anybody know where in America, I knew it was in America, does anybody know where the, uh, where the Barquetta is? And within 20 minutes, somebody said, I took this photo of a show a regional car show, and it shows this name. Do you think this is the guy? Search, found the guy. The guy turns out to be one of the foremost restorers of classic Mercedes, who has a hobby of collecting Ford and Chrysler prototypes. So I got through to his admin, spoke to his admin, and within 50 minutes, I'm talking to this guy, and he's got a whole slew of about 12 Ford prototypes that he bought when Ford sold uh, its collection of prototypes of Deerwood back in 2002. So within an hour of me asking Facebook for where is the Barquetta, thanks to the wonderful world of connectivity we just never had before, I found the guy, I talked to the guy, and there were photos in the book that he took. Um, and it, because he's a professional, he would have had a professionally shot. And those photos of that long lost car are actually found in the book. So that's the sort of stories which I've, I've talked for hours on this, obviously. Um, that's the backstory of the book. And I can't tell all those stories in the book, but I have to tell you, that's what makes the book, for those who read it, slightly unusual, is getting in for that level. You just couldn't do that 10 years ago. You couldn't find through LinkedIn somebody or somewhere. And it, it's just been an amazing experience. I also needed the help of Ford's retirees, which, despite we're all aging, I suppose, in truth. A lot of the retirees are out there on LinkedIn, as I mentioned. So I started connecting to full retirees, and then somebody would say, oh, you know, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. And, and before I knew it, I was able to connect with people like Bob Lurtz. Uh, Rod and I have known each other for years, but there's, there's Bob Lurtz, there's Stuart Turner, Bill Camperson, the former marketing director. All of these people helped with the book, uh, Richard Perry Jones. So everybody started connecting one to the other, and it became this sort of bigger and bigger story. The problem for me as the writer is, is I have to put my arms around it. It's great having help, but it's, it's as the Americans say, a bit of a fire hose proposition. Uh, I also got the help of probably three, I think, of the most famous retirees of four murder companies now. Um, do those of you know who the guy on the left is? Patrick. Patrick. Patrick Lecaymon. Uh, Patrick Lecaymon is a professional French comedian, I think, uh, and famous car designer. Um, Patrick has been terrific to work with. Patrick provided a lot of insight and Ryan Wicks for the book. He's been an absolute joy. Rod's kindly uh, come along today. And our favorite George Clooney lookalike, uh, Bob Lutz. Um, and, and I have to tell you this funny story with Bob Lutz. Um, I don't hang out with Bob Lutz. I kind of know a little bit. We've exchanged along the way conversations and met, but I don't hang out with Bob Lutz. So, um, so I emailed Bob and I said, um, 
Bob, I'm thinking of writing this book. It's going to be you know, gravitation around the cars you were with and Capri and Sierra. And I thought, maybe he'll reply. And it took Bob 40 minutes to reply. And, uh, and Bob, as Bob does, said, Steve, I'm just surprised it's taken you so long to get around to writing this book. What on earth have you been doing for the last few years? <laughs> and, and, and it's very typical Bob. And, and Bob got more and more enthusiastic. And, and that's why I'm sort of quite delighted that if the book is about design engineering and marketing, we've got forwards from the designer, the engineer, and Bob described himself as a marketer. I think we'll probably read Bob's done a few more things than just being marketing. So that's the, the pillars. And, and it's really nice to have those leading lights from each of those uh, different three pillars right forward in the book, which I think helps set the context beyond the way I can do it by actually having the people that are there for it. Um, so let's use the current cutting edge technology here and move this slide forward for a second. There we go. So <coughs> I mentioned I wanted it to be readable. Enjoy this trip, for it is a trip. <laughs> Who knows that phrase? Fat boy slim, come keep with me. Um, so, um, <laughs> I use music throughout. I happen to love music. Uh, I like doing service in the car, but I do also love music. So I've used a lot of music themes from 80s, 90s to keep it alive in the book. So you'll find, for those who read it, there's always a little bit of a reference to a music title in there. So these are the decades ago. I say five decades because as an engineer, I was very weak. The six, as you can clearly see there. Uh, 60s, we start with total performance. Now, I'm too young to know what Henry Ford did with total performance. Um, that was fascinating to go back to that era and understand. 70s, Ford of Europe, national to international. As I started researching the 60s and 70s, I'll be honest with you, in this Brexit era, I had no idea how Ford had pushed the government to actually join the EC as it was. I, I had no expectation how strongly that was going to come in, into the book there. To be the setup of Wally, the setup of Mercury, as the company expanded. Then we go into the 80s, where, you know, uh, for the, uh, any of the design team here? No? Uh, Okay, so you guys stop being called stylists, so congratulations there. And Patrick I still remembers that moment where somebody called him a designer for the first time. He thought that was great. Um, then we, we went into the aero everything. That's the that's slightly unusual era where we had ovals on everything there, um, and, and new age and retro. I found that because it's more my time, I found it fascinating to write it my time, but from an historical perspective. So I really enjoyed writing that section of the book. Um, Horsepower to brand power, the work I've worked in, where you know, we finally had to realize not everybody wanted to go 150 miles an hour, and there was this the realization that we need to sync the brand up with the car. Um, and, and where we are today, um, to, to, to paraphrase Shirley Bassey, it's all just a little bit of history repeating itself. Or is it? I mean, we're in a, we're in a time of change like you couldn't believe. You know, my, my wife is insistent that you know, it's red and it's got Apple CarPlay. And like, horsepower? Yeah. Um, and that, that's the world we've changed the world. And so what I think is you can always pick up and learn from the past. And there's a bit of inspiration, I'd like to think, for, for a company I care about in the future there. But that almost sounds like uh, I, I, I'm pitching the book. It's just been more inspirational for me in some ways to see what this company has done along the way. So that's, that's the trip that the 50-year journey uh, undertakes. So what I'll do now is kind of take you into some of the work and share some of the backstory here, because I'm aware a lot of you here have actually got folks, so I want to be sure that, 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 that there's something fresh here. So this is total performance, and I just love these two images on, on the right there. The one you see there is the GT, that's the car that came up through an evolution into the GT40, that's the, and it's, it's an incredible chalk a little bit, you know, it's, it's a beautiful piece of art. And then we go right over that juxtaposition of the current GT there, and all the drama that's in that, and don't let anybody take anything away from the fact you can't put any, I, I resent any accusation that you can't put drama into one car. That's got every bit of passion and drama in that vehicle on the right versus the one on the left. But I love that because both of those pages are about 10 from the beginning and 10 from the back uh, at the end of the journey. And I just think it's a nice, a nice juxtaposition. But where we start is Henry Ford and Total Performance. Um, and that gave us GT40. The Coupes, Mustang and Capri, and we obviously know Mustang's the survivor, and running school. And I find it wonderful is the Americans say the red thread that runs through the book is those three bounce their way through the book and they survive today. And I think that, that mutation in Ford's genes, if you like, is fundamental to its soul and never to be to let, to let go of that, to be, to be frank. And I think it's wonderful that it's there in the company's genes and long may it continue because 
That's not there in most other mass manufacturing. So <coughs> let's go into it a little bit more detail now. Um, oh, thanks for using the rest. So when it all started to swing, so um, I'm sure, I'm not sure, when I worked here, but I'm sure most of you today will know that's Henry Ford II. Uh, and again, I mentioned, I'm trying to skip over that perhaps a little bit there, where we started with um, Henry Ford is the, the whole total performance concept. But again, interesting to see how Britain was suddenly cool and the dark days of the Second World War. It was, the clouds were gathering. This chapter is probably the most academic of any of the other chapters. I think it gets a bit more pacey and racy as we talk to other people. But I still found it an interesting chapter because I wasn't there, basically. Um, it, it, it's that point of the company being on. Um, that's the GT we have there. And then at the bottom, Mustang on the left, uh, Capri on the right. Now, in truth, because, and I'm, you know, I appreciate the lobby dying in from various occasions, um, for those of us in the Britain, we think of a Capri as being kind of like a British car, but it was actually designed um, uh, Jill Spear and um, Steve Shearer in, in Dearborn. The first concept was actually the recognizable Capri was very much a Dearborn car. And 25% of all Capris were actually sold in the US. In fact, it was the second best selling imported car in America. After the Volkswagen Beetle, the Capri is the second best selling car in America, uh, during, uh, second best imported car. Uh, during the time it was on sale. It was incredibly successful, it really was. Um, and I find it fascinating because that's a bit of the story that gets lost, is the interrelationship between Ford's coupes. If you think of the future, for those of you that read the book, which just will talk to you, if you think of Cougar, you think of XR4 and XR49, they've always had that relationship. And it continues today, obviously, where we've got Mustang and Ford's success. So that's the story being set up there, the relationship between, between those different vehicles. And then we go into, into the beginnings of the germination of Capri. And I, I love this picture here over to the, uh, over to the, over to the right. Uh, and, and I don't have time to go into all of it. There's a bit of rebellion going on. So they took the American design. And this is done to basically, or Avery as it was then. It's got three flutes on there, not the two at the back. And this was the British design. It looks like trying to mutate and push the American design, of course. To the point where they designed their own competitor called Flowline. Very French looking thing, I think. There. And so there was this tussle between um, what the car was going to be. And again, I never expected to pick these stories up from the people that did this. I mean, these are 50 years ago, this was happening. Um, because what Ford of Britain wanted to do was make the cars on, on the right, which was an Escort Coupe. And it's been fascinating. Escort Coupe has always been like a, a, an itch that I think Ford has always wanted to scratch. And the closest it got was with Puma, ironically, against the platform. Uh, but hugely successful. That, by the way, is uh, Patrick McCaymon and his third week of work. Uh, I think he wanted to be Van Gogh. Um, and uh, beautiful drawing there, uh, but that's, uh, that's our favorite French designers. Uh, third, third week of work there doing the next school. Um, so let me start getting going, if you like, um, with the brief. Now, I mentioned the marketing. This is, um, this, this is a really unusual square image. Now, we all live in a world where we take photos all day long. This is a two and a quarter inch Hasselblad by a fashion photographer called David Griffin thought. To use fashion photographers to take pictures of cars was just as radical as you can imagine. And so the Capri press imagery, and this, believe it or not, has never been seen in print. I found this in Cologne's archives. Never ever been seen. And on this gigantic screen we've got here, you can't see the color saturation, but the wonderful olive greens with the firm green paint, the model looking at that couldn't be more sexy. And that was taken in Portugal um, with, with, with uh, the, the, and the, the photographer was actually in the water looking up there. Lovely image, but that was part of what Capri was about, was the, the dream, if you like, for the uh, rain-swept Essex winter's days to be in the Mediterranean with a glamorous lady in the sun, etc., etc. That was the dream that was being sold. And although I've worked in marketing for much of my most recent career, I didn't put as much in it in some ways as I could, but I thought this was interesting. It's, this is perception and reality. So this is the task us people in marketing have, is, is to sell the dream. <coughs> so the perception is, is, 
I can't quite see it there, but he's glamorously on a date by the water and everything, dreams of marriage there. And the reality is actually going off with mother-in-law and kids there. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it was a much more literal world before we did digital, but um, that was how you did an ad. You said, sell it to the single guy, and of course, remember, most people are going to the kids, and, that, and that's the ad that we do there. And, and so, uh, and Ford at this time was changing ad agencies. It used a very famous ad agency uh, called CDP, and they brought in the American advertising agency, uh, JWT, J. Walter Thompson. So the ad changes is this very sharp British style of snapshot style photography versus this very dreamy American style, which is in fashion at the time. And what you see there is two ad agencies trying to do the same campaign. Which is Adam, you'll probably testify it's quite difficult. So we'll get it now. <laughs> for two ad agencies to try to work together like that. Um, so that's what they did for Capri, and they sort of got away with it, one might argue. Um, these, I think, are beautiful. So the first thing you're probably going to look at is the, the drama of the sketch at the bottom here, which is by Jim Hirons, uh, who did a lot of Sierra interior here, um, and still lives locally. And, uh, and obviously, if you're watching Thunderbirds, um, so that's another Jim Heron's designs there. That's actually Dunton, um, 1970. That's one of the early proposals for the Capri 2. Um, so, um, <laughs> life imitating art, I don't know whether it's Thunderbirds or the, the UFO TV series. <laughs> there, but that, that, and if you look here, you can see there's a Capri door sort of trying to creep out of this strange looking creation there. Um, <laughs> This is early concept work uh, by Pavel Lusak, uh, a Czech designer, very talented woman from Audi. Um, so much drama, so much creativity. I mean, this thing looks beautiful down here on the right. Hideously, the cost engineering inside of it would just be monumental. It's completely body basically. Look at no carryover panel. But it looked terrific, so that really never happened. Um, now, this is really interesting. A Taylor two coupes. So, at one point in Europe, you could buy the following two-door cars from Ford Motor Company. Count with me how many there were. There was the Capri. There was the two-door Taunus, Cortina for those of us in the UK. There was the Taunus Coupe. There was the Mustang. There was the Consul two-door. And there was the Granada two-door. So you could go into a Ford dealer in France where the market share was so-so, and you could buy six two-door cars <coughs> That's a brilliant way of confusing customers. That's why for a Europe kind of happened, is stop the madness. So we had things like this, which is a, uh, a two-litre overhead cam, or V6, two-door coupe, rear-wheel drive, but it's not a Capri. Uh, that's your time to Coupe. That's why product planning came into being uh, across Europe, was to stop some of the madness that we see here. These are early console um, and Granada uh, concept sketches by Husak, actually. Um, just to show the real differentiation. Series differentiation is not new. This was going on 50 odd years ago. Um, I just think they're beautiful sketches. They get the chance to use this wonderful maze yellow, which I just adore, by the way. Um, and while I was researching the book, um, I was over in Cologne, and one of the guys said to me, oh, we've got all the, uh, the wind tunnel models we, we've got. Would you, would you like the photos of the wind tunnel models? We think they're in good condition. These things are like brand new, so I'm, I'm creating. The Escort Mark II wind tunnel models. Uh, this, is, this is the Towns Coupe and the, the Granada Coupe, which uh, Granada Coupe was done in London, actually. Um, and so I'm creating these things, these pieces of Ford's history, and they're made of uh, Epo wood. Do you remember any Epo wood? Yeah? You can't lift them. I mean, I'd have stolen things if I could. They're, they're like this big. And so I've got all these, every boy's dream is all these model cars that are gigantic. No prototypes come. Yes, they're there a lot. Um, there's, there's your guys <coughs> for that planning. No series differentiation, they're both at the GXL level. You see the Corti, the Towners, uh, Coupe, and the two-door sedan. Um, the wonderful insanity of buying two, two identical cars, or you could buy a Capri seller. I mean, you can imagine the confusion that would have happened in those days. I think it's just wonderful to see. So that's a story I really enjoy telling, because otherwise I wouldn't want people to think it's a Capri story. It's a much bigger story of a Ford product design and concept. Um, again, this is probably amazing, I think, to discover. Sitting there in Cologne, I discovered um, the two and a quarter transparencies of these clay models. Now, there's such high definition, we live in such a high definition world, it's easy to forget because we can shoot it on our phone. Two and a quarter Hasselblad to take these pictures back in 1970 of these cars, before Henry Ford saw them, 
So these were the cars, the two cars that were shown for the free, presented to Henry Ford. So one was by Claude Lover. Do you remember Claude Lover here? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Hans Smith. Not so remember. Um, so the favorite design was the vehicle on the right. And you can see it's recognizably the Capri II, uh, but it's not at the front. So Henry Ford had it presented to him, and he walks up to this thing and he says, oh no, that's not a Capri. Now, in those days, Henry Ford's decision was the decision. He said, no Capri ever has pop-up headlamps. That's ridiculous. And everybody was floored. There was a silence on that day. And what they did is they hurriedly stuck in here, they set the front of that one, on that one, and that became the Capri, and they got around Henry Ford that way. Hansmuth left shortly after. Claude um, Lobo went on to have a long and successful career with Ford. Um, Ron and I were talking about this earlier. I, I, I found it so much fun to look at the colour and trim. Obviously, colour and trim has been one of Dunstan's strengths, um, and I always urge the company to think like, push this W. It's always been great work done in that field. Um, one of the lovely stories here is this fabric. Anybody know what that fabric called, that tarn fabric? Yeah, Houndstooth. Uh, Houndstooth is uh, that one, I think. That one's called Carl. It was the code name um, for the Capri Mark III. Um, in the modern digital world, we call that an Easter egg, where it's something that's hidden and it's like a little in gag. Um, they called the fabric seat Carl after the car, and nobody ever knew. Why would you randomly give a seat fabric a girl's name? It's because it's Carla was the code name for Capri. Um, so um, the Germans will be wondering what I'm talking about. It was called Alpine in Germany. <laughs> uh, this I thought was lovely. Again, appreciate for those of you in the room with me here, you'll know how product value goes from concept sketches to a seating bath to a vehicle. To see that and to understand my design, being able to conceptualize that, I think it's just a just a lovely piece of art to see the reason. And then remember these are all quite there in the book, is these, these, these uh, watercolor uh, drawings, the original seating button, you can see the word Diana there, that was the code name for the Capri Mark II, um, and, 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 and that final seating button. And by the way, the unique trim pack, that was a lesson that uh, Patrick McCann told me that you had answered, said never again, never design an interior pack that's unique to one vehicle. For those of you involved in trim complexity, God knows, and that, that was the lesson learned on that vehicle. There was nothing that really could be shared with the rest of the range. And they put all their time into the gear interior. They said that they would never do that again. As beautiful as it was, they just put all their emphasis on one derivative to the car. Um, moving on, um, small team of people here, you probably recognize Rob. Uh, uh, getting more towards, the, well, imagination now with, with special vehicle engineering. and. The story of the projection and the zero cosmic anomalies are all in there, but I, I wanted to just quickly look at this picture on the on, on, on the right there. So, for those of you of a certain age, remember the phrase airbrushing? They airbrushed it out for the younger generation to be photoshopped. Um, so, this is the days when airbrushing. This is clearly um, Monument Valley in Arizona, a wonderful place. Um, clearly, these Capris have never quite been driven through the Arizona desert, I think you'd all agree. Um, so, the ad agency, um, and it wasn't, by the way, uh, Ogilvy that did this, I found out, uh, um, this is Burroughs. Um, um, the ad agency took, this, took these cars and they airbrushed them in, but unfortunately they didn't quite tell the, the artists that Ford, the Capri's not four-wheel drive, so we've got four-wheel drive uh, trees uh, in that ad. Um, but there's a lovely story of these three cars. So they were shipped up to Boring for photography, and they were left overnight with three cars. Yellow wheels on the X and on the injection there, and the nasty old steelies on, on the red car. And uh, this being uh, the dark days of 80s Essex, and they arrived the next morning, and you can guess what happened. All the wheels have been stolen off the car. Uh, so they've got photography shoot with helicopters uh, to come and do these cars, but they've got no wheels on them. Uh, so the, the, the guy from uh, the, the, the company doing photography, he had to go to uh, Tri Central in Chelmsford, the local dealer, um, get the wheels off the cars in the show. We had to pay cash, uh, get the money out the back, pay cash, and, and he actually drove them back and, and they bolted the wheels on. Uh, luckily, they didn't change wheels that year, uh, and they bolted the wheels on the car, and that's the, that's the, uh, that's the brochure shots that you see there. Um, <coughs> Moving forward, I mean, I just think this is uh, Boots de Fries, a very talented uh, Dutch designer there, um, who did a lot of work in that era. His work always stands out in the book, I sometimes see. But this is a really interesting go. This is Project Linda. 
Does anybody know this Project Linda? So Project Linda was a 70s advanced concept design at Dunton to figure out in about 76 what a car of the 80s could look like. So real deep advanced design. So this is like the missing link. This is the bridge between the, the Erica Escort here and the cars that would have followed was this missing car. So they got it to a level where it was fully surfaced, fully designed. And, and then along comes uh, our favorite George Clooney of the night problems and says, no, it's too old fashioned, stop. And that car was almost getting ready for production. I mean, the level of sophisticated surfacing on that vehicle, you, you see it there if you look at the book, it's pretty much ready. That was a case of like, stop, face lift the existing Cortina, change direction, and the car that followed was obviously Sierra. And I found a fascinating story, um, thanks to Patrick, to, to really dig into that. I've got loads more pictures on that. Here, we move moving to first design, first sketch of Sierra. Um, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, the angle of that window changing, it changes that car. It's a fascinating view. What you see here is the very first uh, 3D resin model of Sierra there. And out of the gate, that car is trying to be a coupe. Instead of being a two-door, the two-door version just wants to be a coupe. And we kind of know what happens. It turns into an example of the right. Meanwhile, across the way in Dunton, um, this is all coming out of Germany. This is what's coming out of the UK, which is a much more conservative, Cortina-ish, reflecting a more Cortina conservative fire. And not necessarily unattractive, but clearly not as radical as we see there on, on the left. And one of the things that Bob said was, look, we had no money for Sierra to do new engines. We, we, the only thing we could do was make it handle well, ride well, and look stunning. So it was really Bob with the Hansen and Patrick McCaymon um, started pushing for this more radical shape uh, in, in deference to what would have been the trusted, conservative, sensitive route of, of, of listening to what would be a UK customer and producing that more conservative design. And now you see uh, in the bottom there, so Goodman and Patrick Kennedy and the design team um, back in 78. So I mentioned earlier um, the two guys that wrote Ford Auto. Two guys did Ford's advertising for 22 years. Isn't that amazing? Um, so remember that tagline, simple is efficient? Um, classic tagline. Um, no, this is the strength of Ford and its best, and then there were two. It's a simple statement. You don't need many words if you've got the power and the authority of the advertiser. Man and machine and perfect harmony. These guys tell the story in here, I don't have really time to read it now, but what I wanted to do was, these are all the fonts that are matched. If it looks like an ad, it's, it's, it's a conceit. It is another Easter egg. That's not really an ad at all. This is these guys writing in the book about their experience of what it's like to write Ford's advertising and the, uh, and the Sierra launch when the helicopter crashed. That's a whole separate fun story. Of, uh, the um, during the course of the book, when I was over in Cologne, I discovered this car here, which is the world's only green Sierra Gosworth. Um, and, and it's as radical as it can be. For those of you that have been coming along, this is a facelift in 1991 car, three door, which existed in Germany, but with the front end of the Sierra Gosworth Book of the rear end of the 1986 original. Um, Mechanic were always, or, uh, actually it was not Mechanic, it was a game pilot plant, which tried to push to sort of bring back the Sierra Cosworth into original form. So what I did with the illustrator, these beautiful illustrations you see here on the wall that come with the book, is um, I brought it to life. So it sits there, oh look, this has never been driven, it's in Cologne today, and the last three months, undriven, never, never used, no mark on it. Uh, it's probably the ultimate collectible barn find, barn, barn, barn find of the world. Um, Within the book, there's always design markers. One of the ones of the things I wanted to do from a design perspective is to give people an indication of what design is. So that talks about the radius. There's a wonderful comment I got from one of the designers is the, the, the radii of the doors were changed uh, because customer research said Sierra uh, uh, glass was too small. So they tightened the radius by 0.0006%, um, which was great for communications management because the glass is indeed bigger um, by, by the size of your, of your fingernail. Um, that's advertising. Um, so I mentioned a Fiat, oh sorry, Fiat, I'll get to Ford Fiat. This is the original design sketch um, of the Barquetta that evolved into this car here. At this shop, I think it looks for all the world like the original Boxster concept. This is 1982, this was. Bob Lutz pushed for this car 
to be based on the XR2 platform. Um, it was then considered for production, and Ford of Britain said, no, we, we love Rod's Escort Cabriolet, we don't want it. Um, but Bob was pushing, Bob had been promoted to work these machines, so Bob pushed it. So the job was, um, he couldn't do the body engineering on it, so the vehicle was given up to Ital Design. So Ital Design, very famous, did all the body engineering on this vehicle. Unfortunately, it's hideous. Um, and so, uh, but then Dearborn got involved, and Dearborn said, but this car needs to have four seats, because we can't sell a two-seat roadster in America. Um, so it required a longer trunk, two extra seats, and it mutated into this car we see here. So this lovely little thing we see starting to come over here. It took eight years to reach production. It was called Capri. Uh, made in Australia, designed in Italy, sold in America. It wasn't a huge success. Um, lasted less than three years in the US market, and it actually is the last Capri that was ever sold, albeit never sold in Europe. Um, and, and that was how it did when we take it. One of the things I discovered, uh, talking about was this. This is a, an RS Coupe, rather lovely. Uh, designed by uh, Pinky Lau, who's um, until recently one of the two designers of Porsche. Very fresh design, very unusual uh, concept there. And forgive the orange wheels, maybe, but uh, that car went on to live a different life. It was using Mazda 323 because they didn't want to go there, so it was not in the cycle. Um, that car will even become the Mazda MX-3. So the Japanese loved it so much, they actually made a pet car with Ford design they didn't want to. Um, and then start drifting into the 90s. Um, the spirit of those cars on the right, which is the early concept sketches in the CE4 looking escort, and the car it became was perhaps not quite as strong as inspired as those early sketches. I know it always happens, but it really started from a strong place. But the problem was there was a legacy through the 80s of conservatism that was creeping into Ford. And that's what you see with this company is, is it reacts and it goes back and forth. It's, it's adventurous, it gets scared, it comes back again. It, it, it's always this push pull thing, and it's success, Bob reminded me. Ford is always successful on a couple of things. It's when it's brave and it does something like Explorer, or it does something like Capri, or it does Cosmo, um, or, or Puma. He it, said that's when Ford is at its best, it's when it's brave. And also when those design, engineering, and marketing people all work together. That's when Ford gets its mojo together, and it comes and goes throughout the company's history. I mentioned Puma. So there's a case in point. Very strong design out of the gate, um, but also very strong marketing. Do you remember the Puma ad with Steve? Look, you're, you're all nodding instantly. Such a strong piece of creative. That advertising made that car cool. It, that car was never ever seen by car enthusiasts as being a Fiesta coupe. Um, that car was more than the sum of its parts, not just because it was a good car that was well designed, but because it was well marketed. And the strength of the marketing campaign behind that was just good quality creative because it brought the car to life. It was nimble, it was alert, it was a bit edgy. It was cool. Steve McQueen was cool. That's good advertising and good design working together. <coughs> Um, um, then we go to Cougar. I think it's one of the most interesting stories. So this is a car um, that was actually designed um, by, by, by one of the British designers who's moving over to the airport. Um, could have been almost a Scorpio in some ways. It could have been a Lincoln. Um, this was designed to replace um, this car. Or is it? It's on this page. Um, the American uh, Mercury Cougar, large two-door Cougar. In the end, the name was belonging and used on this vehicle, which was the replacement of the Ford Pro, the Mark III Pro, and became the Cougar. And you can see some of the early design sketches, including the late Chris Benson, uh, who was here, uh, who sadly passed away a few months back. And he's done a lot of strong design. He did Cougar as well. And uh, Cougar's a fascinating story. It's such a nearly car, great looking car. It was just, just, time was beginning to move on a little bit. What we were at this point, we kind of, it feels like this is all very recent, doesn't it, by the way? This is just reminded you 20 years ago now. Um, for those of you like, oh, I was too. I was thinking, oh, I remember that. I was like, hang on, it was 20 years ago. Um, um, this, this is where you see communication change. If you look, this almost looks quite modern, strange with this image, doesn't it? And the reason is because now we're seeing imagery being digitally retouched, it's softened. There's a perfection that we see that's almost perfectly glanced sometimes because of the level of digital retouching. You don't see the suspension poking out and a bit of grill, plastic, screw or anything. Everything is beautified. So we get this very tasteful look, 
that's now crept in, but that's because everything is tasteful, if you like, but it kind of also can occasionally lose some of the images. Things are shifted again, because everything now is online, we want striking images again, so it's digital Christmas has come back in. Because we look at everything on our phone, everything has to be against the white background, so these big romantic images, they're dropping away faster and faster and faster. And that's actually a bit of a loss in some ways, because you can position a car from communications perspective, the romance of the road, or whatever it is, I don't care. But the point is, everything has to be so crystal sharp now, because it's got to fit with a tiny screen on the phone. Um, and we've all got an attention span of probably one second. Um, that's, that's how long most people will look at that for on Facebook, is one second. Um, uh, Facebook say the longest will be 1.3 seconds. Um, Um, then we are sort of getting into much more recent times. Um, the car you never promised yourself. Uh, anybody here? Did you work on S two seven two? Nobody wants to stick their hand up there. Um, who remembers Martin Leach? Yeah. And there we go. Um, so this was uh, Martin Leach's idea. So originally there was a car you see over here called the Pininfarina Star, and Jack Nasser um, had struck a deal with Finifrina to produce a series of cars, one of which was the, the cup, the two seat, uh, street cars, sorry, the, the two seat convertible, um, and what was later the Focus CC. Um, this was supposed to be the third car, which was this vehicle, uh, which was a Focus based product. And uh, Martin looked at this, and I actually go back and forth whether I like it or not, true, but you have to remember this is like 2002 or something. So, Martin Leach um, said, well, hang on, this could be a, a Capri. And I was working at Consulting University, and Martin got hold of me and said, I need you to come and look at this thing. And done it. I was working, my company was working pretty much full time with GM. I had a conflict of interest. I couldn't come back into Dunton. That was the, the only other time I could I couldn't come back into Dunton, much as I'd love to have helped with this program, um, because I was committed um, with, with, with GM. But this car, a long way to see. This is a time of retro modern cars. Um, this is the Ford Bronco. We're going to get Bronco again. I don't know if it's, is it sold in Europe? Are you bring the Bronco for us. No? Um, so Americans get very excited about the Broncos coming back. They actually designed this car back in 2002. <coughs> the problem was, is these retro modern cars started suddenly not selling. The Thunderbird. You remember the, the Thunderbird? I adore the Thunderbird. I love to have a Thunderbird. It's amazing. Um, looks wonderful. But nobody bought it. And there was the problem is, is if you produce a retro modern car that is a misty eyed fall back car to the car, if you try and, the worst thing you can do is try and sell an old man's car to a younger person. So what happened was they designed the car that goes everybody over 55 and 60 in America, and everybody under 55 and 60 in America can't find one of those. Okay. So they, 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 they made a gorgeous looking car and it just didn't sell. That began to kill this program over here. Which is it's important to bring back the Capri. And, and, and so this is a dramatic story in truth. Um, it's, it's a little bit in terms of Rod and I were talking about uh, Martin Leach earlier, but you know, the story of this car is very much um, related to that man. But when he suddenly left, it, this lost its impetus. And it was shown as, as one show car uh, and, and never to be seen again. He is actually kept in the story of that. Um, and then um, we come full circle, really, to today. And that was one of the things that uh, I think was a right thing. Ford said, well, don't end the story back in 2003 on a bit of, oh, we didn't do that. Great. Let's bring it up to date. So there we go through marking up, you know, as we've done with all the other designs there with Mustang, bringing it through right up to date. And what you see are the three icons, the GT, the RS, and uh, the Coupe survive today. And I thought my illustration design did a wonderful job there where you see the the ghost of Mustang appearing from Capri and um, Focus RS, RS Cosworth there. So that's sort of where the book signs off. And, and from the book's perspective, I was really happy that I brought it up today in a spirit of optimism, particularly as Ford is going through such a time, time of change. I mean, it really is no illusion. But looking back, well, there's lots of inspiration what total performance was. This company reinvented itself and reinvented itself time and time again. It did that starting with Henry Ford and total performance that led to led to those three icons. And from the book's perspective, I then started, you think finishing a book's easy? It isn't, because it's the world of Facebook. So I'm going to people change. 
when are you going to do a signed limited edition version? Oh, so in the end, I, I sort of came. Um, so I ended up doing this version of it, uh, which took another month to, to write, um, to do to do a signed version. So that's what everybody seemed to want. Um, and that has an extra chapter where I worked with Patrick, and we we marked up all of the original cuts. So if you look at this poster here, everybody loves a poster, it seems. Um, we went through that, the extra chapter covers each of those cards, the designer's notes, if you like, from the period um, where we went back and actually marked up the individual cards. So that's a fun extra bit, if you like, uh, from a book perspective with the, the final chapter there that's, that's in that version of the book. But I, I just thought they were lovely. I, 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 I suppose I'm biased, but I still think they look rather cute. Um, and so that's really um, the content of the book. And I guess the question now is anybody got any questions really? So thank you.